Just wanted to tell you that we always record the... Yep, that's fine. Um, and we'll be waiting for a couple of minutes after the after 10 o'clock because there are a lot of stragglers who show up. Completely understand. Plus, we got to wait for Sam, too. He's the yes, key. of course. <laughs> he's, the, he's the content expert. Although I can explain a bunch as I was you know, senior author, editor on the, paper, on, the, on the paper. But I'm just more of the, there he is. Wonderful. So I was explaining to um, Ken, uh, Sam, I was explaining to Ken that uh, we wait for a couple of minutes and then we have a two short announcements which will be more of an administrative nature before we start uh, because we are under the hyperledger umbrella so we have we are forced to not forced to but we do follow a couple of rules that sounds great uh very nice to meet everybody uh, so are you able to see the share screen or should I give you the uh, I'm I, I've I'm seeing uh, myself and Ken on uh, video and there's uh, about uh, five of uh, others who are not on video I don't mind um, but I'm, I'm I'm in the zoom room um, I've got a few slides that uh, will uh, work as a companion to uh, the talk that uh, Ken and I are prepared to give, uh, but as long as I can uh, share my screen, uh, I should be okay. Do you see the green share screen button at the bottom? I do. Okay, so once we start, you can uh, share your screen, but in the meantime, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. One is we are meeting under the Hyperledger umbrella, Hyperledger Foundation rules, uh, two things. One is uh, the antitrust policy. We are supposed to be following the antitrust policy, so no antitrust busting, I mean, trust busting on this call. Wherever you are, you know the laws. Uh, the second is more of a... Um, code of conduct, which is, you can disagree with uh, Ken and or anybody else, but you have to do it without being disagreeable. Uh, this is an open debate call, so, and without much more waiting, we go forward with this call the call is being recorded and i will uh, post the meeting uh, notes page and uh, ken is going uh, i mean i think it is uh, she uh, sam who's going to uh, make the presentation with able assistance from ken who's the principal author uh, thank you and onward and upward. Uh, thank you so much for the intro. Um, it, maybe uh, it would start well um, if uh, I'll give a brief introduction. Or, or Ken, why don't you introduce yourself and I can give an intro and uh, jump in, give um, a little bit of uh, backstory on Soda, um, kind of uh, why, how we got to this particular moment. And then, um, you know, I would like to open up you know, hear from the community, um, you know, and obviously, Ken, uh, any thoughts you have as we go through this, um, but also would love to hear from you guys, any questions you have, and, um, you know, really intent is to make this as interactive as possible, um, and uh, yeah, it does, how, how does that sound in terms of formats for your usual meetings? Oh. Uh, Ken, do you want to just hop in and uh, introduce yourself? Sure. So Ken Fromm, um, an author and editor of, of this uh, piece. So I'm uh, managing director of Build ETH, which puts on events. Um, and also 
uh, working on several other projects, um, doing a lot of content marketing, et cetera. All prior to this, used to be for three years at the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, doing the uh, education and director of education and development. Um, met Sam about a year ago, and he was uh, working on the statement of digital assets. I said, this is amazing. So my thing was really just coming in and helping um, with the paper. Um, Sam is obviously the content expert on this, but certainly I've picked up a fair amount in the past year. So I'm really just here to provide just any color analyst or support um, as as Sam you know, take, uh, leads the presentation. And, and, and Ken, you're too modest, but uh, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll start with an introduction on myself because I think that really dovetails well into sort of um, how we got to the statement of digital assets. Uh, Propeller has been around for about 15 years. We provide essentially a full stack CFO down to staff accounting outsource solution for VC backed startups. So the thought is you've got a early stage seed A, uh, uh, seed series A, series B, and sometimes even series C. Uh, their team should be focused on building, selling, and scaling, not having necessarily perfect instance of QuickBooks. And while it's great to have a CFO around, really at your seed through A and B, you, there's just not 40 hours a week of work to be had um, at those in those ventures. Uh, I started at Propeller about five years ago in our SaaS group. Um, and uh, about six months in, uh, I was assigned a new client um, uh, that the uh, resource manager said, well, they're Bitcoin, crypto, blockchain. I've got no idea what they do. Do you want them? I said, sure. So that client ended up being Solana Labs. Um, and very quickly, it, it dawned on me that, you know, in addition to the finance and accounting work that we're going to have to be doing for all of our other clients, there's going to be this second layer of crypto finance and crypto accounting um, that uh, really uh, didn't didn't really exist at the time. Um, so uh, it, we kind of jumped into it. That was really my step down the rabbit hole. Um, and uh, as of today, we're working with... Um, about 50 or so uh, Web3, um, everything from infrastructure, uh, DeFi, CFI, uh, uh, NFT gaming, um, and a, uh, about nine or 10 different foundations and VC firms. Um, and really, you know, I think the, the goal, or I'd say the secret sauce of, you know, our practice, which is directly related to SOTA, is, is taking on-chain activity and translating it into gap. On the PL side, it's revenue, cost of sales, expenses, and then calculating realized gains. Um, and then on the expense side, um, there's a, again, uh, I'm not sure the, uh, the, the accounting depth of the audience, but the rules for, uh, in general, for reporting digital assets, have you uh, reporting uh, your crypto on the balance sheet at the lower of cost or impaired value. That's not an absolute, but um, in general, that's where things stand with FASB. Um, and so I remember the first time we were um, getting close to a, uh, a close and we were doing our, all of our calculations, doing our, our, our reconciliations with our subledgers. And we got to the point where we um, you know, got to the, the right number for the balance sheet for the close call. Um, but it came to about $7 million. Um, I knew that our client who was a, uh, an L2, um, had actually several billion dollars of their native token in the treasury. Um, and we were going to be going into a close call, um, sharing with their CFO that, uh, you know, on their balance sheet, they were sitting on, you know, a fraction of that. Um, and the, <laughs> the call went, as I suspected, uh, the, you know, the number was questioned, we justified it, we showed that it was actually correct for gap. But it, it dawned on us very quickly that that number made no sense. Um, and that gap really had was doing the industry a disservice in terms of um, forcing uh, the, the reporting of digital assets to take the form of uh, uh, it's called in, an intangible, in, an indefinite intangible lived asset. Um, and basically, that means you can only mark it Excuse down, you me, can never uh... mark it up. Yes, sorry. Um, if you could go into the presentation mode um, and a slideshow. Oh, are you, uh, are you not seeing my screen? I am seeing the screen, but uh, if uh, you transition to a slideshow, then we will just see your presentation rather than your tabs and 
Everything oh, I'm. Uh, oh, I apologize. And, Sorry, I'm. Uh... And, and it's okay. Uh, I I don't want to short, stop your flow, and of course I must apologize because I did not uh, introduce you guys properly, even though you had sent me your bios. Uh, oh no, uh, not not no problem. Well, is that how is how is yeah, that? Uh, uh, the slideshow was on. Yeah, this is it. Great. Thank you. Let me, so uh, please uh, go ahead. I, I'm. Sorry to interrupt your flow. No problem. And and I think uh, as I as I sort of alluded to, um, you know, my my bio uh, it, it very much kind of trails into the uh, you know the moment we are in, and in, in, in as the as this slide slide's title puts out there, why soda? Um, but so you know, we we came to the conclusion that essentially the balance sheet was not um, you know I, I'd say that. Uh, we say that uh, locum, which is lower of cost or market, um, which is a current um, reporting standard for most digital assets. Um, basically, the balance sheet is broken for um, many businesses that carry digital assets on um, on their books. And that is because you've got no sense of uh, the liquidity behind um, what that entry is. Uh, in, you know, I think that... Uh, <laughs> There is very much a break amongst our clients, and again, we're dealing. We still work with Solana. We work with Optimism. We work with Masari. Um, a bunch of uh, call it uh, crypto native and crypto adjacent businesses. But then also, you think about other um, uh, businesses that just carry uh, digital assets. It could be NFTs. It could be um, you know anything else. Um, but the, the balance sheet is is no longer telling you. I mean it. Traditionally, a balance sheet, the role of it was to tell you what you owned, your assets, what you owe your liabilities, and what's been invested to you. And, you know, as has been saying, the, 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 uh, you know, the balance sheet for a business that's carrying digital assets on, uh, is, is, fundamentally, is fundamentally broken. Um, so not only do you, and, and the best practice also is to um, essentially track all of your digital assets in a single single sub ledger, which then again on the balance sheet not only does not give you the right uh, value of what you're carrying, it doesn't even break out what the individual assets are. Um, so these are, are really you know some of the, the core problems that we we began to to realize existed. You know when we had to be reporting per gap, which is fundamentally the language of business. Um, but, you know, then I also had to be um, working with operators who were dealing with digital assets. Um, you know, finally, also, I think, and, and again, I'm not sure I, I, I should have actually asked, uh, I would have loved to have heard a little bit more about the background of the folks who are joining the call today. But you, you, you say the word treasury amongst nine or 10 different uh, crypto finance and accounting executives, you're going to get 15 different answers. Um, it's become something of an, an amorphous um, term. And one of the things that I think I, I really wanted to begin focusing on was how do you then you know, begin at least to say, when you talk about treasury, it's at least talking about the entirety of all the funds um, that, it, that an entity has control over. Um, so that brings us to the statement of digital assets. And where this started from was um, again the entry, and actually, I'm going to fast forward to here. Um, if you see on a general ledger um, down here, there is a single entry that is cryptocurrency. Um, that is a number that you know this, what I've just been rallying against doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, so what we did with the statement of digital assets is we we took that number and said, okay, if that is our starting point. Um, you know, the first challenge, uh, you know, going back to the, uh, the L2 that I mentioned was, you know, how do you actually begin to start answering the question, what's in, you know, what's in this entry? And we started with this concept of talking, thinking about wallet asset pairs. And so, well, let's just start by just doing a build to say, you know, we know that we're reporting in this case, seven and a half million dollars in the balance sheet. Let's actually just show what's in that. And I, I know this looks very, um, basic, uh, but this just isn't done. When you talk to accountants who are closing the books, um, they will, they, and you want to prove out that number, they will show you reams of uh, reconciliation analysis and data. Um, but it really took us quite a while just to say, 
to prove this number out, we were going to take wallet asset pairs and add them up. Um, once we did that, though, we realized that you know that is uh, that's that's good and it's showing that we're doing our work, but it doesn't actually l let the operators of these businesses understand their full liquidity. And since we had basically all the data, uh, we said, okay, well, let's bring this to fair market value, which is not what you're reporting in terms of gap, but it's very important in terms of uh, trying to manage your entity, whether it's a foundation, um, organization, uh, uh, project, what have you, or if just you're sitting on digital assets on your books. So in this case, um, this uh, imaginary entity is sitting on uh, $3 billion of their native token, which is, this is not, these are not uh, numbers out of left field, by the way. This is pretty commonplace. So all of a sudden, you know, when it, me as an operator, I want to know, well, first of all, where <laughs> the, the numbers that I'm reporting on my P&L are correct and, or on my balance sheet are correct and that my my books are, are good so I don't go to jail for tax evasion. But number two, you know, what is my what what is my true liquidity? And that that three point three billion dollars is not your liquidity. There's tax implications. There's liquidity discounts. But you're beginning to be, get a sense of the range of what you're actually uh, what you're what 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 you own. Um, and then taking that a step further, um, you know, I've got some clients that are have terrific wallet hygiene that have a half a dozen wallets, and every wallet has a very defined use case. I've got other clients that have. 50 and some have 150 wallets. So the ability to begin to tag each wallet with roles um, or specific tags, and then essentially do roll-ups. And you know, that again, allows you to then um, begin to slice and, and, and dice the data, make, make your wallet and uh, treasury view um, you know, uh, suitable for, for management. Um, uh, you know, and that's, that's kind of the way we, you know, that's what we developed for the statement of digital assets. Um, well, let me pause there for a second. Um, I, I, I'll get into um, kind of the expanded use cases and sort of what got us into the white paper in a second. But um, does anyone have any questions? I guess this is Ken. Let me just maybe uh, summarize. So on the bottom right, you have that 7.5 million, which is basically the book value. So that's the line that would go in the balance sheet. The statement of digital assets is a backing sheet to that number. And what you've done here is break that out, not only with the fair market value, which is the column on the right, uh, which is according to gap, but that other, oh, sorry, the fair market value. So the book value, so the book value is on the right. So that's gap uh, accounting, which gets you to the 7.5 million. What you've done is uh, basically come out with a second column, which is the second from the right, which is the fair market value, which goes through and provides an SM FMV for um, the digital assets. And that arrives at the number of the 3.3. And basically, so this is the statement of digital assets, which is the various columns with the role of the wallet, the asset type, the quantity, and then the two columns, the fair market and the book value. So essentially what, again, just summary is what we've done is take that single line item on the balance sheet and provide more detail to it uh, to provide a better view of the liquidity of the organization. Yes, and, and that's, you know, I, th I think that that explains it well. Um, you know, I think, that was, and I'm sorry if there's other questions from the audience. Anyone? Uh, yeah, please do not uh, hesitate to ask. Uh, yeah, let's wait for awkward silence. Yeah. And, <laughs> and we're going to wait for a real until it gets people start squirming. And then the and, first person. And, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but Money uh, looks yeah. like he has unmuted, so he might ask a question. Awesome. A and I always have questions, which, uh, you know, I don't want to take the lead on questions. So what happens is money probably is going to ask a question. Yes, yeah, sure. uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Vivian. Hi, this is Manny Palai from OTC Digital. Um, I, I have a quick question on the custodian trading account where you say the fair market value is 576, but as the book value is, what are the gap value is one, a double of that? I mean. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, this should be a actually this should it's be five hundred times. 
right? I mean, seven million and three billion. No, I, this would be pre-impairment. Um, so we 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 run our impairment um, tests on a uh, annual basis. So, uh, I, it, it, are you are you asking why is it why is book value higher than fair yeah, market value? Correct, in that? Correct, correct. This this in this case it, it's pre-impairment. So uh, I uh, that would be that'd be the answer. Okay. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely correct. And I think depending on the organization, you can have. Um, I, I I believe uh, Coinbase does impairment testing every 15 minutes for private cust for private entities. It can be uh, uh, on an annual basis. Um, uh, but good 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 catch. <laughs> uh, so we were we were running this analysis for our clients, and as I mentioned, they were all VC backed startups. Um, and it was really meant as a tool for operators um, to to really help run their business from a finance and operation operating lens. Um, and I would say it was probably you know about the time when actually uh, Ken and I met that you know I was going through this process. We were doing we had a few audit ready uh, audit preparedness projects. We had a number of. Uh, 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 v, uh, clients getting ready for uh, VC funding. Um, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden, a lot of what we were doing here seemed to have relevance in other areas that were finance and accounting related. Um, and so we put our heads down and said, all right, well, you know, we've come up with something that is a, I think, a, a very valid approach to a, a very real problem. Um, I would say maybe two years ago or three years ago, it was like, oh, this is our secret sauce and we've got a proprietary thing here. Um, the reality is I think probably you lock everybody on this on this call up into a room and say, this is what you need to come up with. You're gonna come up with something pretty functionally similar. So, you know, instead of trying to create a walled garden around this, um, I think it started with some of the conversations I had with Ken, there was a thought to say, um, why don't we turn this into a best practice open source um, opportunity and create kind of a, a public benefit collaboration and come up with a white paper that actually shares, um, you know, this as a as a way for the industry to, um, you know, create some common ground and and uh, have a standardized reporting mechanism. Um, and that's really where I think the the white paper that we shared with you guys um kind of started and you know again you know our focus has always been with management ops um but you know speaking with the team at Andreessen um you know they're you know they love the uh they love seeing the um the, the great things that their port codes are building but they still need to have their uh, management reporting in U.S. GAAP and they need to be under, able to understand what is uh, what is sitting in wallets? Not necessarily just being able to um, take a look at a subledger or of uh, go go and be able to double check their uh, their holdings, but actually being able to understand it and be able to make judgment calls within a gap framework. Um, and in, you know, the same is true. You know, I'm not sure how many folks on this call have uh, gone through a crypto audit or have begun to uh, you know try to find an auditor who's willing to take on a crypto client. It is a non-trivial task. Um, having your ducks in order before you try to start um, getting audit acceptance is absolutely essential. Um, we have worked with Big Four who have uh, helped validate SOTA as a way um, to be audit ready. It's not a, a guarantee that you'll find an auditor if you are using SOTA, but it'll make it a lot easier for audit acceptance. Um, and you know, in a similar way, uh, there's uh, uh, when you are in the process of uh, well, taxes. Um, similar conversations with other big fours who are saying yes, having your books organized um, in this way um, will help uh, help the tax process. But again, getting into other areas as well, um, you know, making sure that you're staying up to date with your if you've got a, a money transmitter license. Um, with your filings. Um, and then finally, you know, again, we live in a very, you know, um, the, uh, the the rules that govern foundations are not necessarily the rules that govern private companies. There's a need for openness and, and you know, some, a, a certain amount of public disclosure and sharing with the ecosystem. And that's, that's, you know, again, 
creating a standard where you can control exactly what you're what you're sharing and making sure that what you're sharing is in line with what industry norms are. Um, and again, we've gotten support on that as well. Um, that's, and so again, we started writing this white paper, I think it was probably about March of last year. Um, it was Ken, myself, a colleague of mine. Um, we had representatives from big four, um, major VCs um, and major projects contribute. Uh, if, if you've opened up the first two pages, um, uh, we are still working through attribution approval for some of those other names. Um, so I can't mention them here, but uh, that will be a part of the V2. But um, we really put our heads down and just decided that we wanted to create this open source benefit for the industry. And um, I, we were able to, I moderated a panel at Mainnet in September. On stage with me was M. Westerhold from Andreessen, David Bird from EY, and Plash Agarwal from OP Labs. Um, uh, to to unveil uh, Soda. Um, and where we are right now with it is um, uh, in the process of getting the full attribution approval. Um, there's some, some, a few sections that we are tweaking. Um, we've also gotten, uh, 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 we've, we've created partnerships with all um, major crypto subledgers, Bitwave, Cryptio, uh, uh, Integral, and Traces in the Works. Where they're going to be rolling out hand soda reports um, in their systems in Q1, um, and what we're going to be hoping to do in Q1 is, in addition to announcing our other um, contributors who, uh, once it work, get, it gets through their policy departments, um, is a, uh, a an endorsement period where we will be looking for people who are working within this industry, controllers, CFOs, anyone who needs to be tracking digital assets through a gap lens to basically endorse this as, hey, this is a system that I am in, I'm using that works. Um, and again, I, I really can't stress this enough that the real point of this is a public benefit uh, collaboration um, to, to, to create a best practice for the industry. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think there is growing up that needs to happen um, in a lot of sectors of digital assets, but ultimately I think, um, having sound reporting is probably, you know, one of the most important, if not the most important um, single thing that we can do to, to, to help bring digital assets uh, into um, the business models that um, are, you know, that the, 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 the mainstream is, is accustomed to, uh, to working with. So let me, let me pause there. I think I've been sucking all the air out of the room, but Ken, anything else that you'd like to add? No, I think you did a great job there. I think the only thing is that we cut passed over this, the importance of the subledger and the involvement of subledgers. So, can you explain it, it, what the subledger is? Absolutely. And then also, their involvement early on, and then what their formalization of this in the, as a, you know, prepared report means. Um, Absolutely, that that's a great point. And sorry uh, for for jumping over. There's uh, uh, quite quite a bit here, but. So I'll 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 rewind back to my uh, experience with uh, Solana and uh, my early days in crypto. Um, we actually did not have a ton of so when we started working with Solana, they were in testnet. Um, uh, there were some token movements, but it was it was um, primarily focused on um, employee comp. Um, and we started working um, about eight months later with an L2 that was also in testnet. And we had come up with some clever Excel sheets and um, uh, to basically price transactions. And the rules around this are when you either get tokens coming in as revenue, you have to price that when the token um, enters your wallet um, and you have dominion and control. And when you, um, pay ETH out for, for gas or your native token as a uh, as uh, compensation, you need to, uh, again, also price that at the at the point of the transaction um, in US dollars. Um, there's tax consequences as well, put that to the side for a second. But uh, the timing and pricing of that is a <laughs> is, 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 is not a simple thing. And so uh, a subledger essentially is a system that um, you you know plug your wallets in, you plug a variety of rules in, um, and when transactions happen, 
it prices those transactions um, and ultimately delivers journal entries to um, uh, to the accountants to then include in if it's QuickBooks or uh, NetSuite, we've got the general ledger here. So you can see um, on this slide the you know the digital assets and the activity are number one. Um, all that data flows into the subledger. Um, that subledger then, um, and I'm, I'm gr grossly oversimplifying it, kicks out what you need to be putting on your P&L and balance sheet. Um, and that's where the accountants take over um, in terms of making sure that the uh, income statement flows, the balance sheet balances. Um, and then ultimately in this uh, slide here, you can see the statement of digital assets um, is then supporting the general ledger um, again, also tying back to the the subledger as well. Uh, so, but we were in a position we had not. <laughs> there, there were no subledgers four years ago, um, and we we're doing everything in Excel spreadsheets. And then uh, our our L two client came along, and we realized that you know they said, "Well, we're going to be rolling out." We said, "Oh, no problem. We've got a model that can totally handle this." And well, we expect that we're going to be pushing through. You know, starting out with a half a million transactions a month, going up to you know, probably five or 10 million transactions a month and very quickly realized that, you know, whatever janky model I had built was not going to be able to handle that. So we ended up uh, partnering with Bitwave early on. Um, they are one of the leaders uh, still in the space. Um, but again, their job is basically to take the uh, on-chain activity um, and uh, put that into a journal entry that we could then include in the income statement and then also the balance sheet. I guess if 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 there's not questions out there, I'd love to hear um, you know from the audience. Uh, how what do you guys do? How do uh, digital assets impact your business? At, and how have you been handling your um, you know the, the, any any digital assets, crypto um, on on the balance sheet in terms of just practically getting the books closed if that's where you're sitting um, or making sense of it all. Um, but, you know, can, I'd love to, you know, just talk about context a little bit and, you know, hear how, how you guys are, um, you know, working within crypto and accounting in your, uh, in your day to day. Don't hesitate. Please ask questions or make statements. And, uh, uh, Vivian, if you want to call on people uh, and uh, put people on the spot, I've got no problem with that either. Um, well, I'm, I'm many again, uh, maybe, you know, we are much more focused on um, real world assets or, yeah. or trade by assets, um, but it still has the same kind of similar problem, although it's not as complicated as as cryptos. And I, have, I mean, I also gone through <laughs> cryptos on a personal basis, bought and sold cryptos, and, and I had to somehow come up with uh, tax you know, tax entries for IRS. Um, for traditional assets, we do have market prices, uh, but for private assets, we're still going to have problems because these are not priced often, but that's the same problem as traditionally finance, how they do it. Um, my, I don't see anything, anything significantly coming out, um, any significant issues, uh, for traditional assets, but I don't know. I want to take, I mean, I want your take on it and see anything that you see that could be more aligned towards cryptos. Yeah. Well, so uh, first of all, um, great, great, great point. Um, and you're actually um, zeroing in on one of the, the sections that we will be including in terms of use cases for our V2. Uh, I attended a, a McKinsey roundtable in July on the future of tokenization in financial services. And it was, you know, all about token, tokenizing repo agreements. You know, it was a month before the JP Morgan announcements happened. Um, you know, fundamentally accounting, you're going to be accounting for, um, you know, the thing you're going to account for the thing, the way the thing should be accounted for. And I know that is a, a word soup that doesn't mean much, but, you know, if you're if if the rules around uh, uh, financial assets mean that you have to mark to market, you're going to mark those tokens to market. Um, however, like you mentioned, if it's tokenized real estate, um, it will sit on your books. Um, uh, and I apologize; it is morning in San Francisco, and I've got the uh, sun 
um, blurring in from the south here. So uh, uh, apologize for the uh, the the shade. Um, but no, I think that you know when you start thinking about real world assets, or as some people are liking to call them, um, off chain assets. Uh, you know, I think there is absolutely the need. Um, you know, okay, those are going to sit on the balance sheet somewhere, and if they are going to be sitting in wallets. Um, they still may be rolled up into a single line item. So, you know, where I think we talk very much about crypto and whether it's Ethereum, Bitcoin, or a native token, that's really been the focus of a lot of our clients. But I think the same is true, especially depending on what the business is. If they're holding tokens of a, uh, a real world asset, they have to live somewhere. They have to be, you know, tracked, you know, you, you appropriately um again i'll just go to real estate if it's a you're tracking it at the cost basis but you're you're going to have the same you know uh running a whatever uh business it is you're still going to want to have visibility to um what the fair market value is you're also going to want to have um the ability if you've got a variety of um you know holdings to be able to you know roll up your um fractionalized real estate or fractionalized and, and I, again, the accounting treatment is going to be different if they're financial assets. But uh, I think that, you know, again, you start thinking about, you know, the tokenization and it's really it's, you know, statement of digital assets, uh, statement of, uh, of, of, you know, tokens owned. There's there's other ways of maybe, you know, more artfully, um, you know, call this that, you know, can have it can address the real world asset piece. But I think that is. Yeah, that's going to be, I think, the, a, a major story of this next cycle. And I'm very excited that I think that this framework really can support, um, you know, again, you know, you, we, we can tokenize the world, but we still need to account for it somehow. Yeah. And it still needs to be in, in, a, in a gap context. Sam, Sam, this is Ken. Can you uh, roll back to the, the, the statement itself um, and we can show the columns? Um, so basically, yes, yeah, so over real world assets, you know, you would be facilitated by this organization um, because and, and by the framework. So, again, this gets tied into the sub ledgers, which get tied into wallets, which gets tied into on chain um, you know, verification. So essentially what you're doing is using this as the way to formulate or, or, or structure your holdings. Um, so this could be helpful in pre audit and audit stages so that basically you verify that you have these holdings um, in that particular account and at that particular price. And then from there, if they're real world assets, then you're going to want to you know, further step to say, okay, well, let's ascertain then those real world assets and those connection between the token and the real world assets um, and actually verify, you know, there'd probably be off-chain activities, but essentially this structure would help with all the on-chain activities of the token the separation of the token or the organization of the token um and then as sam said you could roll it up into these could be real estate assets or they could be tokenized bonds and any particular so essentially you could have wallet and the role um could be the different type potentially different type of rwa that that they might be I mean, and again, I mean, this would this would not only be for just reporting on a balance sheet, but this is for any internal reporting, investor reporting, however you want to organize this for any additional downstream uh, reports of your financials. Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, trying to figure out if there's any difference between holding a physical real estate uh, and tokenizing them and holding the assets in my wallet. The values are same. What? The holdings are the same. Is so the 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 main difference there would be if I, I think the, the the benefit of being able to fractionalize a single property. So, uh, was the St. Regis it, or the um, it all it already okay. happens in the form of mortgage backed securities, except it's a pool of assets that back the mortgage backed securities. In fact, valuation of mortgage backed security bonds is a very tough thing to do because. Uh, sometimes there's slicing and dicing of cash flows, uh, which uh, lead to, you know, CMOs and other, where the pricing of those are, um, you know, also risk weighted uh, and of that kind of, uh, you know, difficulties. But money is talking about, of course, direct uh, 
direct holding of fractionalized real estate, like a commercial building, huge commercial building, maybe. So are, are, are you saying, so I mean, look, I, I think if I own, you know, 555 California outright and well, first of all, I, I wouldn't be sitting on my balance sheet as a, as a single line item. But I think that, you know, if if there is an opportunity to, you know, fractionalize that ownership and that's done through tokenization, I mean, that I think that has the, the uh, you know, from a real estate perspective, I think that's, you know, that's the why you would tokenize. And then again, being able to then have, you know, the unit, you know, in a, you know, having have a, having a framework to capture the unit, I think is is the ultimate benefit for this. Okay, you got it. Okay. So, so you're, um, I mean, I think I also misunderstood uh, Mani's earlier question, which was uh, something about uh, the fair market value versus book value. <laughs> uh, m m m Mani caught me, actually. So we had... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so the um, per gap, you you I, I mentioned this earlier. You need to be marking your assets to market and marking them down only, not up. So in theory, your book value should not be exceeding your fair market value. And again, depending on the organization, um, you, you you don't have you don't have to be doing impairment testing on a daily basis, although pu some public companies do. Um, but your book value should always be at or below your fair market value. And I think that's where uh, uh, good, 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 good call out money. And I will, I will actually adjust the, uh, the slide appropriately. Okay. Um, um, let's continue unless you know, we should open it up for questions, but maybe later on. I'll yeah. Let me just put, yeah, let me just put some context of where we are with the process and then we can, either take questions directly on this the report or on getting involved in what we're doing. So as, as, as Sam said, it's a public benefit um, collaboration. And so we're trying to present this as a framework uh, for the industry. And we've done the first version, say say this version is 0 0.9, and we're looking to add uh, some, some areas, uh, specifically when the use cases, we've got some VCs and others contributing um, and we're also getting the subledgers on board and we're looking for endorsements uh, for so the final version v1.0 would be released in in January. And then from there it's just all about um, you know helping to support um, you know the education and, and knowledge of this. but essentially once it becomes encapsulated in the subledgers, a lot of that uh, gets carried forward by the subledgers. Thank you. So should we continue or? Yeah, but then maybe also for some context, what is the um, you know general industry uh, backgrounds of, of folks on the call? Uh, I can say about myself, I, you know, I worked for a long time in traditional finance, but then got, became a, a evangelist for blockchain back in 2015, but I've written a lot of systems for mostly for trading, but I've also written systems for other aspects like, for example, uh, Audible, which is a media company, but I was involved with the digital um, representation, uh, you know, the <clears throat> layout so that it preserves uh, integrity and uh, also preserves a way to not be copied, which is what let them be a big company. But, you know, variety of things. And then of course, now I'm in sort of a more on the monetary policy angle, but I'm definitely interested in risk management and these concerns uh, hit directly at risk, risk management because liquidity uh, and uh, the not only just the fair, fair market value, but who controls those wallets uh, become very important because uh, you know if somebody just dies and 
you can't access the wallet, then you're done. I mean, okay. like it happened in Quadriga's case. Um, but anyway, uh, I leave it open to the others to uh, talk about themselves. Yeah, that that's a great point, and I'll just uh, one 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 minor point to add in there. Um, you know, the uh, statement of cash flows um, was not adopted by FASB until 1987, and that in part was due to uh, scandals that went on in the 80s, the savings and loan crisis, and really a lack of visibility to um, what a business was doing. Um, you know, in you know, and what what could be seen when you're just looking at an income statement and a balance sheet and uh, a variant of the cash flow statement, but was not a formalized document. Um, and you know, I think that to your point, you know, being able to provide the transparency um, and to create best practices for this industry. Um, I think is critical right now. And I think the opportunity to standardize this or a, uh, a an evolved version of this um, is a terrific opportunity, not, you know, obviously just for, you know, folks that just want to make more sense and make better investing decisions, but also for, I'd say the broader industry in general. And, you know, I think we're, we're past uh, some of the wild Westy days of, you know, the previous cycles. And I think what we're going to be getting into in the next Hopefully, uh, we're in the nation points of an upturn and um, a broader market adoption of, of digital assets. But, you know, I think with that, there needs to be a, uh, a mature way to be able to account for it all. Anybody else wants to provide their uh, background and experience and their comments? Hi, uh, so my name is Michael Chang. Uh, I, I just joined the uh, conversation. Uh, do you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes. Uh, so uh, so I'm now on a university faculty, and then I'm uh, my expertise is developing BC system in order to catch uh, the uh, the major concern which I talk about, uh, risk, efficiency, and also try to find out the values that uh, we can uh, capture the most uh, in order to uh, develop the BC system in the way uh, people want. So uh, so I, I have an accounting background, so uh, generally I understand the topic we're talking about here. So basically, uh, so according to my understanding, you know, when the, the crypto or a, a blockchain world is new for uh, accounting finance, area so there's a need for us to come up with a standard okay uh to help the authorities and the regulation to, to come up with a new standard okay so that's the standard is gonna be used to govern all the subsequent uh people uh or like business you know who has uh involvement you know using uh crypto or tokens uh, or blockchain so I would love to work with you, try to find out that, you know, how a blockchain system can be developed or designed in a way in order to best accommodate all the considerations we are talking about. And then, uh, so uh, great to meet you. And then looking Likewise. forward to keep talking with you. Likewise, and uh, I, I I appreciate your, uh, your, your thoughts and especially, and if I'm getting the question correct, you know, the, the how do you uh, standardize uh, or how, how do you take the, um, the, I'd say the ethos of smart building um, to, uh, you know, making sure that it can be accounted for properly. And um, we have had more than one uh, occasion where we've had clients approach us um, who have built out something that is really cool but is absolutely, it, you, you couldn't account for it, where reward, where you would, you know, the equivalent of staking would go out, but staking and the reward would come back in in one lump sum. Um, and, you know, I think this is a developer, you know, doing something too cute um, and, you know, impressing maybe other developers, but creating, you know, elements that, you know, are not 
not not workable in the real world. And uh, I'm I'm not sure if that was uh, you know uh, addressing your your question, but you know I think having um, and I think this ties directly back to the maturity of the industry, but you know bringing in um, you know the core principles of accounting. Um, you know, earlier on in the development cycle is, is, and, and understanding that these are the standards that will have to be, um, you know, uh, you know, attended to is, is huge. And, you know, I think you also mentioned government standards. And I think my, my goal is not to create regulation out of this. I think it is to create self-regulation. And it is to say that, you know, if we as an industry can come together and say, this is what we're doing, um, you know, I don't, I, I, I've, I've met uh, the folks at FASB. Um, I'm not a, an accountant by trade. I got my career started in investment banking. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, if the industry can create a standard that it can adhere to that makes sense, that's not, um, you know, designed to hide anything or rip off investors, that, you know, the rest of it will come. But I think that this is, could be an exercise in self-regulation. And that's where I think, um, again, getting, as Ken talked about, you know, this endorsement period and getting practitioners um, involved um, and saying, this is a system that makes sense. This is a system that works for me and my business. Um, I think that's where I think the, uh, the, the opportunity really lies. But Stephen, yeah. good to meet you. And uh, or, I'm sorry, Michael, Michael. Uh, Good to meet you, and thank you very much for participating today. And I, uh, I will, uh, I will, I'll, I'll ping you on LinkedIn uh, after this call. And then, uh, thank you. Very, very uh, enlightening. Uh, so, uh, the I understand that you know for blockchain developers. Okay, so what's lacking right now is that there's no governing rule. Okay, like there's like uh, like a federal regulation governing what to do. So when everything is blurry and it's hard for tech. Uh, technical people to develop a corresponding system that can be adopted by the industry. So I know this is more like a button up process. The the like you know, Sammy, you are developing this kind of the standard, and then so more and more people are uh, uh, using it, and then so that's gonna influence the people in Washington D.C. and then, uh, and then grip you know shape you know the 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 the, the federal regulations about you know how in the future the the gap or the accounting, you know, the academia, you know, how they're going to set up the rules in order to best capture the the, the essence of the, the blockchain world, you know, according to a uh, gap, you know, standard. So I understand that. And then so I would love to join with you, you know, uh, for, of course, you know, I'm in academia. I try to uh, tackle the fund, uh, the quintessential uh, values or effectiveness and also the risk behind. And then so that uh, we can really make it a a a, a hit, and then try to to uh, to bring in more impact and to make a compelling uh, case, and then and thereby we can influence the regulators and who's gonna adopt, you know, what we are thinking about. I I think you're spot on. I think also there there is a level. I mean, I think there's a you know one of the amazing things about and i'm I, I i wish i had more of a engineering background and i you know could could code stuff and have fun with building cool things i just get to support uh teams that do have those skill sets um but you know i think that you think about you know the the level of responsibility for anyone who's building something new and you know i'm not saying come to propeller but you know if you're thinking about building something you know checking checking with your cpa is probably a good start to say um, or checking with an attorney um, is is a good start for you know a, a responsible entrepreneur as well. Um, yeah, I, I I go to Consensus. I go to Mainnet every year. Um, I also go to ETH Denver. That's one of my favorite places to go. Um, in part, you know, when the world was falling apart last in this past March, um, walking around seeing kids in the dev houses, you know, not not giving. A, Caring a lick on what the price of ETH was. Um, I was also having conversations the year before with this is the same conversation over and over again with, you know, that was kind of the everybody was hot on spinning up a DAO and, you know, DAOs were going to be the solution to all of our world's um, corporate governance issues. Um, but everyone, you know, so what are you doing? I'm building a DAO. Oh, that's great. Um, what does it do? Well, fill in the blank. Um, 
where are you guys based? Where are you domiciled? Oh, we're nowhere. We're everywhere. We're, we're not incorporating, you know, and that was, you know, again, it just, to me, number one, that uh, is just irresponsible because they're going to be um, taxed and taxed everywhere and having unlimited liability. But it's, you know, it shows that the irresponsibility of folks who can just build stuff and put it out into the world. So I think that, you know, I think there is, you know, providing the easier on ramps to understanding what they have to do is absolutely, I think, part of, you know, part of what this is about. Sorry. Um, and that's uh, out there. Money is unmuted, so maybe yeah. ask something to add. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you uh, verify the content the content value of uh, wallets do you do it yourself or you use uh, third-party vendors to so um okay so i guess uh us as propeller uh we use uh this the, the so the sub ledgers are essentially the um you, you basically load wallets into the sub ledgers and the sub ledgers will um not only pull the accurate balances out but then they're also going to identify all the transactions, let's say within the given a given month. Um, so I have, rely heavily on subledgers and these subs, you know, this is Bitwave, this is Cryptio, this is Trace, Integral. These are all the, um, those are probably the four leading uh, subledgers. Taxbit has a product that's coming out soon as well. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just, the reason why I'm asking is, is more and more now you're getting zero knowledge proof based confidential assets and where, where you can't just get the value directly from the wallet. And Okay, that's a. Th thank you for 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 mentioning that. That's a that's an interesting take. I mean, you're still going to be, yeah. So, look, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, one more time. I, I said you're still going to be getting values, but uh, through a zero knowledge proof rather than looking at the actual addresses and so on. Right. Uh, anyway. Yeah, I mean, you, you, so there's. I, I I can opine on this. I don't have an answer. Uh, I think it's a good point. I think the questions I would ask is, you know, the, and, and by the way, this is, you know, everything I'm sharing and, and what soda is, this is, you know, I'd say the first order is, this is for internal um, management ops uh, to do their job. Um, you know, I think as you start, you know, expanding this out into what you want to be sharing with the public, that can be pared down. Um, regardless, you're still going to need to be able to track your cost basis for tax purposes. And you're still going to, there's going to absolutely going to, and, and this ties back to, um, to Michael's question, um, you know, there's still going to be a need to do the accounting for it. And again, I need to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I need to dig in a little bit more, but, um, one way or the other, uh, if you're transacting anything on chain, that still is going to have to hit your P and L. And it's still going to have to be tracked on your balance sheet. So I'm just curious on the side track. I mean, it, yeah. I don't know whether you have come across the uh, uh, wallets with Zcash in them. Uh, no, I have. I, we have not. And you know, I think for the most part, you know, our clients are, um, you know, I, I'd say largely defining, calling them web. You know, they're 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 using blockchain. They're using tokens to to build on as a technology as a technology primitive. Um, uh, have not come across Zcash um, uh, in 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 our client base. Um, I'll uh, just I'll just stop there. Yeah, uh, we are rapidly approaching the end of the uh, hour, but I have a feeling that we can go on for another you know a few minutes uh, if there's interest from the folks on the ground. Um, and anybody else? Uh, looks like Robert McKay is unmuted. Uh, I don't know whether he wants to say anything. Um, I, I guess. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Excellent. Um, yeah. I, I just. Um, I was kind of wondering. Um, would it not um, maybe make sense to actually include some of the um, kind of blockchain um, identifiers like wallet addresses and uh, potentially funding transactions? And I, I guess again, in the case of like zero knowledge proofs, some kind of like cryptographic proof in the actual statement of digital assets itself. Because at the moment, um, nothing that's actually in there is in any way verifiable. Um, you're basically relying on the auditors, I suppose, to have done their, or I guess the subledger companies to have done things properly. But um, I'm, I'm, 
sorry. First of all, um, excellent question. Um, and I, I was going to actually go, if, if you go into, uh, and, I, and I, I apologize, I'm going to have to hop off in six minutes. I just bought five minutes internally, but um, within uh, with, so if, if you actually go into the um, document that we shared uh, on the first page, we actually, this uh, is my screen still being shared by chance. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Uh, if you could see, uh, okay. So the full statement digital assets actually has wallet addresses over to the right here. So um, if, if you go into the actual uh, document, um, we, there is a section where the addresses exist. Um, again, this is, uh, you know, this is really used number one by the folks who have access to the wallets, the CFO, the controller. Um, so Number one, this is you, you do have the addresses. It gets a little bit squirrely if you're dealing with um, a custodian. Um, uh, so, uh, but basically, there are internal references that we would be listing out there. Um, let, let me see if I can actually pull up that uh, that schedule. Um, and in terms of getting in and showing the actual to the transaction level, um, that is again actually. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if you were uh, going back to the uh, the conversation we had regarding the subledgers, all of the transaction data is is captured in the subledger. So um, it is a it can get big and messy and uh, uh, kind of unruly to see all the transactions, but it's it's essentially a double click away um, from from this and. I don't know if you can see uh, if this is making sense here, but it's a little bit small, but yeah. So essentially, this is um, you know this is really the the full breakout. So you'd have um, you know the, the address ID or uh, or if, any kind of internal reference for if it's if it's held by a third party uh, custody service. But yeah, no, gotcha. it, and the way that we think about it too. So um, and sorry, we're jumping between schedules here, but, you know, the, the data exists, um, whether it's, you know, held, held in custody or if, if it's self-hosted, all of that feeds into the subledger. So um, the subledger, if, if it's our company, it, you know, we have access to, um, the wallets we have access to, the subledger is aggregating all of this. And really, ultimately, it's a subledger that, you know, spits this out um, and gives us uh, you know, the data, not in this clean format in, you know, it, it shows every transaction, you basically can pull up the, um, uh, the, the master ledger and any of these things over the course of a month, you know, you can have a million lines of transactions that need to get um, basically summarized into this. So um, this is kind of the first step in, you know, and then, you know, as you want to understand, you um, you know what what is going on in any of these wallets uh you know they're that's what the subledger is there for um, Thanks. um i yeah. just had one a quick question um you, you mentioned a few times um a number of these subledger companies um yep. but um it was quite fast and i didn't really catch them at all um and i'd actually never even heard of this entire industry so i don't know if you could just repeat them again like a bit more slowly of course of course bitwave is bitwave. We, we, uh cryptio yeah. Uh, Integral. Integral. I think I actually have heard of those guys. Uh, Trace. Trace. Uh, Taxbit has they've they've got a uh, a product that's going to be coming out as well. Um, uh, can a we lot share of... this? Can we share this uh, presentation on the meeting page so that Robert can get all that information from there? Um, I mean that. Not just Robert, but all of us uh, who want to participate, uh, since this is an open call. Uh, uh, absolutely. How? What's the best? Do you want me to just type type them in? Uh, in no, the no, no, no. Just send send us the presentation. And we oh, just... oh, the deck. Yeah, ha happy to share the deck. the deck. Yeah, I think in and the, the deck is 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 really a summary of the white paper. I realize that. Uh, um, oh, no. I realize that that's thir 31 pages of crypto accounting that my mother hasn't even gotten through yet. So uh, uh, I, uh, I will, I'll, I'll share the deck uh, as soon as we get off. Yes. And also uh, I will share your 
um, I mean, your address is known. Um, so maybe they can ask questions. Uh, I, I've, I've included in the chat the a list of the subledgers along with their um, Twitter and uh, links. I've also included propeller industries in there as well. So I guess that if you want to grab that, maybe and include it in the uh, notes. I, I, I will uh, I will normally expose the chat on the meeting page um, I, I, and the um, and also the recording because these two things are important uh, for people who want to dig deeper. Uh, the it's always a very delicate task here when you we have about one hour to balance between the detail questions and something that is more in the you know on a strategic side or let's say global or overall side so that, that that's always a challenge and you're coming to the end of your time here sam i understand uh, and I, uh, my thanks to you uh, we we can still extend the meeting a little more even if sam has disappeared um, uh, so that's Thank you all. And I, so I also just dropped, um, I believe the um, the presentation is uh, should have read only access. Dogs, yeah. yeah. So um, let me know if there's any issue um, getting that and I'll, you know, more than happy to. Uh, uh, yeah. Believe me, we'll, we'll be in touch. <laughs> great. Uh, I, I appreciate everyone's time today and, uh, and please reach out to me directly with questions. I'm happy to hop on the calls. Um, I am out next week uh, for the holiday, but um, really appreciate uh, everyone's time and, and patience with us. Yes, and, and Sam, this is Michael again, and I'm very thrilled by uh, what you shared. And then I believe that there is a way we can design the system in order to be um, make it more adaptable, you know, regardless you know how regulation changes, we can make it more adaptable, you know, to what the require uh, the environment needs, and then so that. We can make the the system okay to be robust and strong, you know. Uh, so I would love to further talk with you and try to see that you know how we can collaborate, you know, to uh to make a uh very strong uh, idea or framework, you know, that we can use to uh to persuade the regulators and also to work with the IT people in order to make a reality. So uh, I'm I'm giving you my my contacts here. Uh, how may I get uh, hold of it? It'll be in the meeting page, like I said, and I will oh, okay. also send it to send it to Sam. Okay. Okay. Good. I, I'm love to talk with you further, Samuel. I, I look forward, Michael. Again, uh, maybe week after after Thanksgiving would be ter terrific. But I'll look forward to being in touch and appreciate your comments. Appreciate everyone's time, and uh, we'll look forward to being in touch. Thank you all so much, and have a, have a good holiday. Thank you. Um, anyway, we can uh, have a couple of more minutes here if uh, people have comments or anything else to say. I'm going to take yeah. off as well. Thanks, gentlemen. Take care. All right. Thank you. Um, anyway, fascinating meeting. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, continuous audit, uh, which is a big thing, and also XBRL, which is a which is a standard for uh, reporting, and any standard that takes into account all this ha has to be able to provide that output. Um, but you know, uh, since the main presenters have left, unless you guys have something more to contribute on the topic. Uh, let's call it a day. Is that good? All right, then. Thank you.